Good morning and welcome once again to our Sunday worship service. To begin, we would like to just register our appreciation to the government of the Republic of Kenya for reopening the places of worship. We are grateful that we now have permission to be able to physically gather together in worship as a congregation. And even if the government has given us permission uh, to be able to regather in worship in our different places of worship, as Nairobi Chapel and Gong Road, we have chosen to adopt a gradual and a phased approach to the reopening of our place of worship. So this month of July, we would like to announce to us as a congregation that we will actually continue our online services until the end of the month of July, and we hope to launch the physical gathering for the purposes of worship in the month of August. We will communicate to you the schedule of the services that we will be uh, holding from the month of August. I know we have missed gathering. I know we have missed worshiping together. But allow us as a church, as Nairobi Chapel on Gong Road, to take the place of caution and to be responsible and to be slow in reopening our place of worship with the primary interest of the safety of our congregation. So again, continue to pray with us even as we roll out this plan of the different services that we'll be offering for you to be able to come and worship with us. We know there are restrictions in terms of numbers and there are protocols that need to be observed. And we as a church intend to comply to the highest standards of hygiene and the highest standards of safety. So let's continue to pray as we look forward to the opportunity to physically gather together in worship. Now let me turn our attention to the Word of God. Um, those of us that are joining us for the first time this Sunday, maybe your guests or you're visiting with us, last Sunday we began a new series, a series that we've titled Waymaker, the journey that is ahead of us. What we're doing this month as a church is we're looking at a biblical picture that is in the scriptures in the book of Exodus of the parting of the Red Sea. We're looking at this biblical image and picture of the journey that the children of Israel took from Egypt all the way to the land of promise, but focusing our attention on the image of the crossing of the Red Sea. And we're drawing from that biblical imagery, we're drawing from this amazing picture of Scripture, some very key lessons that could help us as we navigate and go through the journey that is our journey through this COVID season. So we'd like to turn our attention now to the four lessons that we are learning together as a congregation this month as we journey through the book of Exodus. There are four lessons that we're going to be learning. Number one, and this is the lesson we learned last Sunday, is the lesson of place. Because to begin this journey, the lesson that we learned is that this journey actually begins when we are in the right place. And we talked about the COVID season not being a mistake. It's not an accident because we serve a God who does not make mistakes. And we're talking about us being in the right place. Regardless how unpleasant that place is, we are in the right place. Today we'll talk about the importance of having the right perspective. Because to continue in this journey that is ahead of you, you need the right perspective. The third thing we'll look at next Sunday is the right plan. To get to where you are going, you need to stick to God's plan. You need the right plan to accomplish God's purposes in your life and for me to accomplish God's purposes in my life. And the final um, you know, lesson that we'll be learning this month is the lesson of power. At the end of the day, we will see a display of God's power. We will see a clear display of God's might, even through this journey, as we see God's hand at work, one step at a time. So these are the four lessons that we look at. Today, I'd like to focus our attention on the second lesson, and that's the lesson of perspective. You need the right perspective. The passage that we are in is the same passage, Exodus chapter 14, but today I'll be reading from verse 1, to verse 16. So right there in your home, why don't you open your Bible, switch on your gadget, and turn to Exodus chapter 14. We'll be reading the first 16 verses 
of Exodus chapter 14 as we focus on the journey that is ahead of us and as we ask God to teach us the lesson of the right perspective. I'm going to be reading from the NIV version, the NIV version, Exodus chapter 14, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Pi Hairoth, between Migdol and the sea. There they are to encamp by the sea, directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think that the Israelites are wandering ar around um, the land in confusion, that they are hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he'll pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. Verse 5, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? What have we done? We have let the Israelites go and we have lost their services. So he had his chariot made red, ready and he took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. Verse 8 says, The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites, and they actually overtook them as they encamped by the sea, near a place called Pi Hahiroth, opposite Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching out after them. They were terrified and they cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Don't, didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die here in the desert. And in verse 13, Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance that the Lord will bring to you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff. Stretch out your hand over the sea. Divide the water and the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Today we are looking at perspective, the lesson of perspective. Because to continue with the journey that is actually ahead of you, you need to have the right perspective. Many of us know this story um, of the children of Israel crossing the wilderness. They had already been literally freed from captivity by the powerful hand of God, God using a man called Moses. And they are now in their journey across the wilderness as they go towards their land of promise. We pick up this story when they are encamped by the Red Sea. The place where they were, and we talked about this last Sunday, was the worst place you could ever be. They were literally between a rock and a hard place. There were massive stone structures. There were huge rock formations on either side of where they were encamped. They had the Red Sea in front of them and they had Pharaoh and the armies of Egypt behind them. They were in the worst place that you could ever be. The Bible tells us in verse 10, um, in Exodus chapter 14 verse 10, as Pharaoh approached with his armies, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and they cried out to the Lord. That's what this passage of Scripture says. They looked up, and there were the Egyptians. Allow me to focus today on the organ that we use to see, the human eye. 
It's one of the most amazing organs in the human body. It's one of the most complex organs in the human body. I'm told that the human eye alone has over 2 million working parts, all working at the same time. Many medics say that the human eye is probably the second most complex organ in the body itself. In fact, I'm told that my eye blinks at least 12, 12 times per minute. And in a day, I blink over 10,000 times. Something we don't even notice. Something we don't even realize. As simple as blinking. But this amazing organ that God created is the very organ that gives us the ability to look. It's the very organ that gives us the ability to look at a situation, to see something. It gives us the ability to have sight. This is what I'd like to focus on today. Because there is a difference between sight and an even greater ability that I will focus on today, an even greater ability that looks beyond sight, and that is insight. There's a difference between sight and insight. To look and to see. Because insight is different from sight. Sight is the ability to see. But insight is the ability to perceive. It's the ability to look beyond sight. To look beyond something. To look beyond a situation. And not just to see what is there, but the ability to be able to see what could be there. To see beyond and to see what actually can be there. Sight sees predicament. Insight sees potential. Sight sees the present. Insight sees the promise. There's a difference between sight and insight. Sight looks. Insight sees. Because there are others who look and there are others that can see at the end of the day. Today I'd like to distinguish between these two. Because in this story, I see a group that looks and I see a group that sees. And both of these groups get a totally different perspective of the same situation that they're actually looking at. Let's look at the passage again. Exodus chapter 14 verse 10. Exodus chapter 14 verse 10 says, As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians. That is sight. But in verse 13, the Bible says, Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance that the Lord will give you today. Moses saw the deliverance. The Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians. There is a world of a difference between what you look at and what you see. And we see it very clearly in this passage. The Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians. Moses had a totally different perspective. He saw beyond sight because he had insight and he saw something different than the Egyptians and the army. He saw deliverance. The Israelites looked up and they saw destruction because they focused on what they looked at and there were the Egyptians. The Egyptians and the Egyptian army symbolized destruction. They looked up and there was destruction. Moses looked up and saw deliverance. There's a difference in perspective. When you look at the same thing, and on one side, you're seeing destruction, but on the other side, you're seeing deliverance. And today, I want to look at perspective because your perspective is critical. Your perspective will determine whether you actually see, see destruction 
or you see deliverance. Moses' perspective, when he looked and he saw, Moses' perspective was based on the certainty of his God. Moses focused on the certainty of the power and the ability of God. And that's what Moses chose to focus on. And he saw a clear picture of God's deliverance. In fact, the words that he uses are powerful. He says, the Egyptians you see today, you will see no more. Him, he already saw the Egyptians no more. He already had insight that the powerful hand of his God, the delivering hand of his God is at work. The Israelites looked up and the Israelites' perspective was based on the uncertainty of their circumstances. The Israelites perceived using the uncertainty of their circumstances and Moses perceived using the certainty of his God and the outcome of the two was worlds apart. When you look up at your circumstance, like the Israelites looked up, what do you see? For the Israelites, they looked up and there were the Egyptians. What they saw is what caused them to be terrified. What they saw is what caused them to panic as they looked at their circumstance, as they looked at their situation. I don't know how you feel today, but is that what you feel? Terrified and in panic? Is that what you feel today? It may be a product of what you have chosen to focus on as you look at your situation today. Is that what you feel when you look at your family? Is that what you feel when you look at your job? Is that what you feel when you look at your marriage? Is that what you feel today when you look at your business? When you look at your health today, is that what you feel? It's all a matter of what you choose to focus on. Are you facing today, this morning, are you facing the uncertainty of limited resources? Are you facing the uncertainty of a bad marriage? Are you facing the uncertainty of a nagging Ill illness? Are you facing the uncertainty of a shaky job? The uncertainty of financial pressure, a troubled child, a dwindling business, a bad choice, a challenging relationship, questions that will not let you rest. Are you facing this morning the uncertainty of a fading dream? You know, uncertainty is a reality for all of us. Many of us do not want to be at a place where you don't know all the answers. It's not an easy place to be. Many of us don't want to be at a place where you cannot plot every step of your journey or your life. We don't want to be at a place where we cannot preempt every action that we're taking or to be at a place where you cannot eliminate a risk. Uncertainty is scary. It is scary. We don't like not knowing. Many of us don't like doubts. We don't like mysteries. It's normal to not want to be at a place of uncertainty because that place of uncertainty makes us feel unsafe. It makes us want nothing else. It's a difficult and it's a challenging place to be. That's exactly where the children of Israel found themselves. They were struggling with uncertainty. They were feeling helpless. They were feeling hopeless. They were feeling stuck. They were feeling confused. They were feeling anxious. They were feeling like they were amidst danger. They were feeling that they had doubts and it looked like they were facing impossibility. Is that where you are this morning? If that is where you are, as we navigate this COVID season, allow us to share with you a message of encouragement from the scriptures that can help you navigate that season because it's probably your reality this morning. The challenge with uncertainty is that uncertainty comes with other things that you need to watch out for. 
Uncertainty comes with cousins and relatives and many other things that you and I need to watch out for. And today I just want to highlight a few of those things. I want to highlight three critical things that we need to overcome when uncertainty begins to become our reality. These are the things we need to overcome so that you can still possess God's promise for your life, so that you can make it through the journey that is ahead of you. These are the three things that I'd like to highlight today, that uncertainty allows to breed, allows to grow in our lives, that we need to be conscious about, we need to be cautious about, and we need to arrest, and we need to speak into. Uncertainty can make you, number one, selfish. Uncertainty can make you, number two, stubborn. And uncertainty can make you, number three, short-sighted. These are the three things that I just want to briefly, this morning, turn our attention to and ask God to be able to teach us to deal with these three things that many times come with uncertainty, come with a season when we are in a place of uncertainty in our lives. Number one, uncertainty can make you selfish. And we see this very clearly in this passage. When I'm uncertain, the only thing that I think about is myself. I don't think about you. I don't think about God. I don't think about anybody else other than me. In the passage that we read in verse 11, the Bible says that this is what the Israelites told Moses. Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to die in the desert? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? In the same verse, in one single verse, they mentioned themselves three times in the same verse. Their focus had become themselves, and they did not have any space to consider anybody other than themselves. They turned against Moses, and they told Moses, look what you've done to us. The focus was ourselves and themselves. They lost <clears throat> sight of the needs of other people. They lost sight of where they were going, of what God was doing. And at the end of the day, their sole focus had become them. And that's what uncertainty does. Today, allow me to celebrate you as the congregation at Nairobi Chapel. Because through this COVID season, when you had the opportunity to become selfish, you chose not to become selfish. When you had the opportunity to focus on yourself and nobody else, you chose instead to consider others that were facing challenges and difficulty in this season. Today I want to celebrate the generous giving of Nairobi Chapel Gong Road Congregation because you have given faithfully throughout these three months for our food bank so that we could have enough food supplies to be able to care for our community and to care for anyone that walked into our compound that was in need. As of last Sunday, we had fed over 1,000 families throughout the COVID season. We had given out 63,000 meals by last Sunday as a product of your generosity. We had already released over 60 tons of food because of your generosity. Thank you for not allowing your uncertainty to make you selfish. And I want to encourage you to continue to give to the food bank because now more than ever before, we have the greatest number of people that are in need because of the duration that this COVID season has been. And we want to continue to encourage you to give to the food bank. You'll see at the bottom of our screen, our m -Pesa pay bill number. Just put account food bank and continue to give generously. The Israelites focused on themselves. This is a natural outcome of somebody that is going through a season of uncertainty. But when you focus on yourself, you begin to lose sight of many opportunities that are around you because you're focusing on yourself. You even lose sight of the resources that are at your disposal. And the Israelites lost sight of their greatest resource and their greatest 
resource was God. That resource of the hand and the powerful hand of God was not in sight because at that point, their sole focus was themselves. They allowed uncertainty to make them selfish. The second thing that uncertainty can do to us is uncertainty cannot just make you selfish. Uncertainty can make you stubborn. In the next verse, verse 12, the Bible said, they said to Moses, this is what the Israelites told Moses, didn't we tell you to leave us alone while we were still in Egypt? Didn't we tell you to leave us alone? God was ready to set the Israelites free after over 430 years of slavery, God was ready to set them free. But what did the Israelites tell God? What did the Israelites tell Moses? Leave us alone. Leave us alone. They were expressing the captive nature of uncertainty because that's what uncertainty does. Uncertainty holds us back. When we are uncertain, we cannot look ahead. Instead, we choose to look behind us. Uncertainty breeds resistance. They were resisting change. They were resisting what God had in store for them in the future. They were struggling to maintain their status quo. They were struggling to maintain what they knew. They were struggling to maintain where they were. They were struggling to maintain what they had. And they did not have space to continue to let go and to let God move them on to what else God had in store for them. Uncertainty can keep you from moving on because uncertainty can trap you in this place that we're talking about of being stubborn, of saying, leave me alone. I don't want to go ahead. Leave me where I am. Uncertainty keeps people from growing. Uncertainty keeps relationships from growing. Uncertainty keeps businesses from growing. Uncertainty keeps churches from growing. Uncertainty keeps institutions from growing. Uncertainty keeps nations from growing because we want to stay put and we want to stay where we are. We are stubborn as a result of that uncertainty. We want to stay where we are and in even very unfortunate circumstances like the one of the children of Israel, they actually wanted to turn back not just stay where they are, but to even turn back. The question I'm asking us today is, is your marriage at this place? Where you're listening to us, where you're worshiping with us from, is there a marriage today that is in a place of being stubborn, a place of resisting change? Because as a marriage... You have decided you are not ready to let the truth come out and to submit yourself to a process of counseling, to a process of helping, to a process of guidance to move on so that your marriage could be able to progress. Have you become stubborn? Have you settled for a place where you're resisting change and you have allowed the uncertainty of your relationship to lock you down to the place where you are? Is there an individual today that is watching us, that is worshiping with us, that has become very stubborn? You are resisting change because you fear admitting your addiction. You fear admitting what has caged you in and trapped you in. You fear admitting the habits that have locked you down because you fear submitting to the process of rehabilitation, to the process of recovery. If you're there today and you are stubborn and you're resisting change, but you're realizing that you need that change, kindly text our WhatsApp number that is at the bottom of our screen. We have pastors that are ready to walk with you. We have pastors that are ready to talk to you. We have pastors that are ready to be able to give you the opportunity to, make the, to take the next step. You do not need to stay where you are. So number one, we've said uncertainty makes us selfish. Uncertainty, number two, makes us stubborn. 
But the final thing uncertainty did to the children of Israel, and it does to us today in seasons of uncertainty, is it makes us short-sighted. It makes us short-sighted. In the next verse, verse 12, the second part of verse 12, they say, didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians. Then they continue. The, the Bible says, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. That's exactly what the Israelites told Moses. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. When the Israelites were confronted with a challenge, and this challenge was the Red Sea that was in front of them, when they were confronted with a challenge, this is what they said. They said, our slavery is better than our promise. They chose to look back at the difficult and challenging season they have been in, and they said that was better than facing this challenge because the challenge is what stood between them and their promise. And they could not see their promise. All that they could see, they were short-sighted, all that they could see was the challenge that was ahead of them, the Red Sea, and they were not willing to be able to overcome that challenge. They couldn't see beyond this challenge. They couldn't see their promise. The only thing that was clear in their minds was not what was ahead of them, their dream, their promise. It is what was behind them, the slavery that was in Egypt. And they told Moses, let's return. Let's go back to Egypt. It's better for us in Egypt than in the place of promise. Today I'm asking you, are you focusing on your slavery or are you focusing on your promise? Are you focusing on what is behind you, the mistakes that you have made, the bad choices that you've made, the, the, the challenging situations that you've had to go through? Is that the point of focus for you this morning? Or are you focusing on the promise that God has in store for you? Are you preoccupied with life before COVID? And allow me to use that timeless imagery of BC, are you focusing on BC, your life before COVID? Or are you today going to preoccupy yourself with what I call AD, according to this passage, your life after deliverance, your life after God's powerful hand rescues you from the difficult and the challenging situation that you may be in right now? Are you focusing on the promise that God has in store for you? Because that promise will only come A.D. after God's deliverance, after God works his hand. Are you holding on to an old job, yet God wants to do something new in your life post-COVID? Are you holding on to an old business concept, and yet God was removing that from your hands because he wants to entrust a new business concept to you? Are you holding on to old relationships and old friendships and God wants to do something new? And for us as a church, I dare to ask us as a church this Sunday, are we holding on to an old church and yet God wants to do something new in us, A.D., after deliverance? Stop focusing on your life before COVID and ask God, what is it that you have in store for us? God's will, most of the time, is always to get rid of our Egypt mentality because our Egypt mentality has no place in the land of promise. Our Egypt mentality has no place in the land that God has in store for you and the place that God has in store for me. We cannot grasp God's promises with a wrong perspective, with a wrong mentality. We need a mentality like Moses's, a mentality that was focused on the certainty of God and not the uncertainty of our circumstances. Let me conclude our sermon this morning by looking at the final verse that we read because this verse, I think, communicates to us the question that many of us right now may have at home. So how can I deal with my uncertainty? What should I do to be able to deal with my season of uncertainty? 
Yes, I've allowed the uncertainty to do the things that we've talked about, to make me selfish, to make me stubborn, to make me short-sighted, but I don't want that to be my portion. What can I do so that I can deal with my uncertainty? Verse 15, the Bible says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? He told him, tell the Israelites to move on. Why are you crying out to me? God tells Moses to tell the Israelites a simple, simple, yet profound, yet powerful truth. Move on. Move on. You know, sometimes the key to progress in a season of uncertainty is not to think more or even to talk more or even to pray more. Sometimes the only secret is to move more, to move more. And that's exactly what God told the children of Israel. To get going, to take action, to do something, to take a step, to move in the direction. And this is where the truth comes. To move in the direction of the object of your uncertainty. The object of their uncertainty was the Red Sea. The very thing that they were scared of. The very thing that they were trembling about. The very thing that they thought was impossible. The very thing that they thought they could not achieve. He told them, move in the direction of your uncertainty. Confront your uncertainty. Take a step in that direction. Because it's not actually the direction of the uncertainty. Beyond their uncertainty was their promise. So ultimately, God was telling them, move towards your promise, even if it means marching literally against the very thing that is causing uncertainty for you. God was telling them, lift up your eyes beyond the Red Sea and see the promised land that I'm giving you and just walk in that direction. Just take specific steps in the direction of your promise, even if it means confronting the very thing that you feel is most uncertain in your life right now. I want you to notice something, that God did not take them around the Red Sea. God did not, did not build a bridge over the Red Sea. He could. God would have come literally like he took Elijah. God would have come and literally taken the children of Israel over the sea. God could have been able to do that. God could have used the image previously of Noah and brought an ark that would have literally fitted everybody and allowed them to sail over the Red Sea. But I want us to notice that God chose to take them through the Red Sea, through their impossible situation, to remind them that we serve a God that is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we've asked or imagined. It wasn't until God brought a threat behind them, the Egyptian army, it wasn't until God brought a threat to them that they marched ahead. I am certain that without the army, they would have never crossed the Red Sea. And sometimes God brings a threat into our lives. Sometimes God brings one of the most dangerous situations in our lives simply to get us going. Because without this threat, without this challenging army behind us, there is no way we can march towards our promise. There is no way we can move forward and confront our uncertainties. Sometimes God does the same in our lives. To help us move towards our promise, God has seen that we have been talking too much, thinking too much, even praying too much, and he just wants us to act. He wants us to do something. And he brings something to make us move, to turn towards the very impossible situation that we are in and to be able to put pressure on us so that we could be able to make it across. I suggest to us as a church today, your place of pressure today may be the podium of your promise. The very thing that is causing pressure for you may just be the platform that God wants you to use to get going. The very thing that is causing you pressure today may be the very place that God wants to launch you from into your place of promise this morning. 
What is your personal Red Sea today? That place of uncertainty, that thing that is impossible, that thing that is unconquerable, that is before you. What is your point of uncertainty? Today I'm asking us, what is frightening you? What is worrying you? What is threatening you? What is intimidating you? What is discouraging you? What seems impossible to you today? What seems unpredictable? What is uncertain before you? What do you think is overwhelming you this morning? The Lord is literally saying this to us. Move towards your promise, even if it means confronting your point of uncertainty. Move towards your promise. Take a step to that which God has already promised and set apart for you. The question I'm asking us today is, what do you need to start doing today so that you can start moving today and so that you can stop staying at a place that is stubborn or even considering turning back? There are many of us who have said many things today. There are some of us here who have said, one of these days, I'm going to get reconciled to my spouse. I'm going to get reconciled to my parents. I'm going to get reconciled to my family. I'm going to get reconciled to my children. The question I want to ask you today is, why don't you do it today and begin to take a step towards God's promise of reconciliation over your life and over your family? Maybe there's someone here today that has said, one of these days, I'm going to get serious with God. Maybe you've said, I'm going to commit and surrender my entire life to God. I'm going to surrender my entire life to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to make God the number one in my life. And you've probably been saying, one of these days. The question I'm asking you is, why don't you do it today? And take a step towards your place of spiritual freedom. And take a step towards your place of spiritual liberty and take a step towards God's deliverance over your hand, over your life. Maybe you're there and you've said, one of these days, I'm going to develop my gifts and my talents and my abilities. Or maybe you're there today and you've said, one of these days, I'm going to literally go after my dream because I know what my, and God is telling you, why not today? Why don't you start today? Why don't you take your first steps today? The question that Moses was asked by God is, what are you waiting for? And that's the same question that God is asking us today. If you need to make your first steps in any of these areas I've mentioned or anything else in your life, again, there's a WhatsApp number at the bottom of your screen. Please call one of our pastors. We have many pastors that are waiting for your call to be able to hear what your commitment is and give you the opportunity to take your first steps towards your land of promise. Would you give us an opportunity to be able to do that? Confront your uncertainty with the certainty of our God. Confront your point of uncertainty with the certainty of God with the certainty of the nature and the character of our God. Let the nature and the character of our God literally overcome the uncertainty of your circumstances and the uncertainty of your situations. Move towards your promise. Refuse to let COVID steal your dream. Refuse to let COVID steal God's promises over your life. Do something today and overcome your circumstance, overcome your uncertainty with the solid certainty of the nature and the character of our God. I'm going to close with a verse that many of us know. It's Romans chapter 8, verse 28. The Bible says that, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and of those who are called according to his purpose. Let me just conclude with this verse and tell us that verse communicates certainty. The Bible says we know. We are not guessing. We are not fumbling. We know for sure, for sure. We base our truth 
on the certainty of our God. We know that God works all things. There is a sense of certainty, but there is also a sense of completeness. The point that God is making is all things. God will use the good, the bad, and the ugly in your life. God will use all the circumstances and all the situations you're going through. All of those are tools in God's hands. Surrender them to him. He will use them. Surrender each and every one of those circumstances. Surrender the ugly, the mucky, whatever it is that you're going, surrender them to God. So the Bible is telling us we are certain that God will completely use everything. He will use all things. And at the end of the day is the conclusion. There is a certainty there is the completeness, and then there is the conclusion. The conclusion, he will use them for the good of you and for the purposes of him. That's what God will do. At the end of the day, he will transform it for your good and for his purposes to be accomplished and to be fulfilled. And we see that in this story of the children of Israel. They based their action on the certainty of God. And God used all their experiences for their good and for his glory, for his purposes to be fulfilled at the end of the day. And this is what I want to confess over your circumstance. This is what I want to confess over your situation this morning. Would you surrender it to God? That certain God, that solid God, that truthful God, would you surrender that to him? Stop being selfish. Stop being stubborn. Stop being short-sighted. Stop allowing your uncertainty to define your life. Why don't you allow the certainty of our God and the promises that he has for your life to define your life? Would you surrender them to him this day? Shall we pray together? Father, we thank you for your word to us about perspective. And Father, if we have had the wrong perspective, we come before you and we surrender that perspective to you. Father, if we've been looking up and there are the Egyptians and the Egyptians are causing us to be frightened, the Egyptians are causing us to murmur, the Egyptians are causing us to want to turn back. Father, we choose today to put aside that focus on destruction, to put aside that focus on the Egyptian army and we choose to take up Moses' perspective. He looked up and he saw the deliverance of our God. He saw the hand of God's deliverance. Father, I see deliverance over our family right now. I see deliverance over our marriage. I see deliverance over our business. I see deliverance over an individual that is surrendering their lives to Jesus Christ and beginning their journey even through this difficult and challenging season, but from a different perspective. Father, I thank you because they are in the right place. But today, I want to ask that they gain the right perspective so that as they take a step into this journey, that they will take that step from a totally different perspective, a perspective that is anchored on the certainty and the solidness and the security and the surety of the character and the nature of our God. So Father, we surrender our uncertainties. We surrender the areas where we've been selfish. We surrender the areas where we've been stubborn. We've surrendered the areas where we've been short-sighted. And we lay aside our uncertainty. And instead, we put on the certainty of our God. And we choose today to march towards our promise. We choose today to not be intimidated by the armies of Pharaoh. We choose today to obey the word of God. We stretch out our rod. That rod is a symbol of what it is that we have in our hands. However little, however small, we stretch it out to our Red Sea today and we declare that it is going to part and we choose to take steps through the Red Sea and march out to our land of promise. Father, we surrender it all to you today. I specifically want to pray for someone that is at home or wherever you are, that you're watching us, you're worshiping with us from today, and today you want to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. I just want you to stretch out your hand like this. Don't stretch it out to your television. Stretch it out to God in surrender. Would you stretch out your hand to God right now and say, Dear Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I surrender my uncertainties to you. I surrender my sin to you. 
I surrender my shortcomings to you. And I choose this day to receive the promise of eternal life through the person of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I accept Jesus into my heart to be my Savior and my Lord. And I lay a foundation of certainty. And I lay a foundation of security. I lay a foundation of promise. Thank you for coming into my heart and becoming my Savior and my Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you and God bless you.